Welcome to Just the Myth. Sometimes you're not in the right headspace to listen to a guy talk about stretching the muscle and tearing the fascia, but you still want to listen to that guy mispronounce mythological names despite his best well-researched efforts. This is for you. On Just the Myth, I'll cast aside the fitness portion of fitness and folklore entirely. There's just some myths out there that I love and believe should be shared that don't quite fit in with the nature of mythic muscle. You and I will explore those tales in this series along with maybe just a tinge of history. Just the Myth's sibling, Just the Fit, is probably more your speed if you're looking for something actionable. Something you can directly apply in the gym for your own edifice. Of course, if you need a bit of both, Mythic Muscle's still there waiting for you. And hey, if you're not interested in the myth and you're just here to support me, you've got a very, very special place in my heart. Thank you. If you want to support me further, you can find me on nearly every social media platform. Patreon, my preferred platform, TikTok X, formerly Twitter, YouTube, Podbean, Spotify, and Instagram by searching for Mythic Muscle Podcast and looking for the helmet crossed with the barbell and the microphone. Celebrating Halloween and our first episode of Just the Myth, here's the tale of Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman. But first, a brief background. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is a short story written by Washington Irving in 1820 while living in England. Irving is quite an interesting individual, a New Yorker born into a relatively well-to-do merchant family who couldn't quite run the family business as those before him, but found fame in England for his writing. Irving's one of the earliest American authors to achieve acclaim across the pond. Writing, though, tends to bring out the morose in many an author, and Irving was no different with his last words being, Well, I must arrange my pillows for another night. When will this end? And then consequently dying of a heart attack in his sleep. Guess he got his answer. Two quick fun facts about the guy. He wrote a biography for Christopher Columbus, and in it, he stated that Europeans didn't know the Earth wasn't flat until Christopher Columbus sailed to the New World. And secondly, Irving's responsible for New York City's nickname, Gotham. While the original short story itself is remarkable, I'm going to be truncating it a bit, and without stepping too far off of the original script, take some creative liberties. After all, the best story one can tell is the one bled from the teller's veins. Without further ado, the epilogue of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. A pleasing land of drowsy head it was, of dreams that wave before the half-shut eye and of gay castles in the clouds that pass, forever flushing round a summer sky. Castle of Indolence. The sequestered glen that is Sleepy Hollow is one of great superstition. It is said that this place tucked away between rivers and trees is cursed. Some rumors have it that a witch doctor held powwows in the town center, drawing the spirits close, disallowing them a proper rest. Other rumors hold that pagan witches of Germanic descent bewitched the settlement. Little is known, and rumors are just rumors. Nonetheless, the minds of the good people of Sleepy Hollow are abundant with supernatural visions and reverence of the spiritual bent. The folks here whisper dark tales, witness sights unexplainable, but no reedy, willowy story holds a candle to the chief apparition. Yes, I speak of the horseman who rides at night headless and heedless of natural law. It is said that the horseman is the true progenitor of all supernatural ongoings in Sleepy Hollow, that from the empty space where his head would connect to his torso, the paranormal extends, draping the forests, rivers, and roads of Sleepy Hollow in an eerie dread. Many a hapless tourist who found themselves riding the dusty, cobbled roads of Sleepy Hollow and its neighboring towns speak the same tale. In the deepest hours, where night is at its darkest, and creatures who'd rather not invoke the ire of the sun only stir, the clopping of great thundering hooves can be heard. Their echoing booms the harbinger of the great apparition who the gloomy townsfolk call the galloping Hessian of the Hollow. Battling the forceful autumnal winds, the horseman rides at blistering pace, shooing the dense, taciturn, weeping willows aside, the force of his stallion's stride snapping the deadened branches clean from their trunks, leaving in his wake the same lifelessness of deep winter. Yet, no stray horsehair, no muddied horseshoe tracks have ever been found. Only by testament of collective assignment is the story believed. Those who tell the tale theorize that the impetus of his unyielding, ceaseless ride is fear. Fear that he might not reconnect his head to his body by sunrise. It is true that none of Sleepy Hollow has ever witnessed the Hessian rioter after the morning cocks crow. It is doubly true that the body of a trooper bereft of his head, cloaked in Hessian garb, lies buried in the graveyard of an old church in narrow vicinity of Sleepy Hollow. 
Traveling upon any path that might lead to the decrepit wooden bridge above the silvery brook set before the steeple of the old church would surely align one with the unremitting Dullahan. Most famous of these who have found themselves in so dire straits is one Ichabod Crane. If you caught sight of Ichabod's sauntering hillside on a cold autumn evening backlit by the beam of a hunter's moon, you would certainly think him a specter of Sleepy Hollow's drowsy tales. Gaunt and rail-like in his appearance, with stark, gleaming green eyes and a thin, long nose that hooks almost avian on a pallid countenance, Ichabod Crane does not rely on his outward charms. Instead, Ichabod finds himself a pedagogue, and a particularly adept one at that. His schoolhouse in Sleepy Hollow is quaint but bustling with youth, who much appreciate Crane's teachings. His style is that of a fair judge. He teaches the youth manners and mathematics alike, courtship and colloquialism. He often would disavow and discipline the unruly child while nurturing those whose backs mightn't carry such heavy burdens. After lessons were over, he would sport with the older children and bounce upon his knee the younger children while the parents toiled away with their homesteading duties. Quickly, a man of such learned talents and ability to entertain became a vital avatar of the townsfolk. Particularly, he was famous within the circles of the local women, flexing his courtship talents and indulgence of the finer things in life, while the rustic men of the farm, field, and forest sheepishly shied away from that which they were not accustomed. And if he wasn't teaching, reading, or wooing, he was Sleepy Hollow's premier psalmist. His voice was mournful and captivating. The high ceilings of the church seemed to clutch at every syllable and echo of his song. Of course, this lended itself to Sleepy Hollow's demure, strange nature. If time would allow, he would nestle himself within the flower beds upon the riverbanks of the Hudson and read of witchcraft and paganism, to which he was a haughty believer of, only stopping when the evening light made the pages a mere mist before his eyes. To which he would then make his way to the old Dutch women who told frightening stories of old world superstition by firelight. How the myriad sounds of the groves and glens could be read as portents of ill nature, stories of things which would snatch you from the bramble and return you to the road a thrashed, macerated ragdoll. On his walk homeward, the dark and clandestine stories of things that should not be would come alive in the forests. Each creaking tree bough was the voice of a summoned demon. A heavy blast of wind was the passing of a phantasm through Ichabod's body, and his own footsteps' echoes were some devilish entity trailing behind him. Yet, each night he made his way safely home, cozy in bed, to doze off to the sounds of dreary Sleepy Hollow's wildlife. Ichabod Crane's time in Sleepy Hollow had been spent accruing a reputation. His goal with said reputation was wealth in the hand of a young coquettish damsel, Katrina Van Tassel, one of his music students, and the daughter of a substantially wealthy Dutch farmer, Baltus Van Tassel. Also pining for Katrina's hand was one Brom Van Brunt, whose powerful physical stature and brutish yet arrogantly fun nature earned him the nickname Brom Buns. To most suitors, seeing Katrina's affections the target of a man as mythic in his proportions as Brom Bones is an immediate sign to look elsewhere. This seat's already occupied. But Ichabod Crane had his reputation, ambition for wealth, and was equally as arrogant as Brom Bones. He would not relent. Brom's horse, Daredevil, aptly named for its untamable nature just as Brom preferred his horses, could frequently be seen on many a Sunday night bridled at the post before the Van Tassel farm. Yet from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances on the young Katrina, her interests in Brom Bones faded swiftly, and Daredevil was seen in other pastures on Sunday nights. It wouldn't be long before Ichabod Crane would find himself the recipient of an invitation to attend a quilting frolic, which I'm fairly sure just means gaudy party, by one Minheer Van Tassel, the wife of the farmer Baltus Van Tassel. Ichabod would tend to his appearance, shave, wash, and brush his ebony black tufts of curly hair, and generally attempt to make himself look less ghastly. He would ask the farmer whose house he lived in, Hans von Ripper, a choleric old Dutchman who'd seen much violence and partook in a commensurate amount of physical labor, if he might take his favorite horse, Gunpowder, to the quilting frolic. Gunpowder, whose name comes directly from its appearance, had a thin yew neck, dusty shaggy gray hair, and a head shaped like a hammer. The horse was broken down from many years of plowing fields and towing lumber. One of its eyes was pupilless and dead, glaring and spectral. The other had a devil's own fire and radiated collar and fury. Hans Ripper couldn't think of a more suitable rider for his steed. Both figures were creatures out of old world myth, shambling things that perfectly resembled the dismal landscape. 
At the grand mahogany table rested Katrina, Minheer, Baltus, Brombones, and a score of other influential townsfolk of Sleepy Hollow. Upon the table was a veritable bounty of bread, sweetmeats, wine, beer, poultry, fruits, and rooters in abundance. As they supped on Van Tassel's harvest, stories came a-flowing, song and dance following suit. Ichabod Crane prided himself upon his dancing as much as his vocal powers. He flittered like falling leaves in the autumn mistral, striking the visage of St. Vitus himself, the blessed patron of dance. And of course, the lady of his heart was also his partner in dance, much to Brom Bones' dismay, who sat jealous and brooding in the corner of the hall. As they grew tired of the dancing, they returned to storytelling. Everyone shared with Ichabod endlessly raving of the things he had heard and read and seen from the old-world pagan witchcraft books. Yet none could topple the tale which our story opened with. On this night, in particular, with all the feasting and rapping of skeletal tree branch against wooden roof and glass window, it seemed all the more palpable. Old Brower, a heretical disbeliever in ghosts, spoke of the church being a favored haunt of troubled spirits. It stands on a knoll, surrounded by locust trees and lofty elms. A gentle slope descends from it to a silver sheet of water bordered by high trees. To look upon its grass-grown yard where the sunbeams seem to sleep so quietly, one would think that there, at least the dead might rest in peace. Yet, he hadn't had time to dawdle as he had only come near the church due to his run-in with the headless horseman, who chased him to the threshold of the footbridge. When suddenly, Brower was ripped from his horse and thrown into the river, the horseman gazing down upon him, bearing the look of a skeleton. The story was immediately topped by Brom Bones' telling of his encounter with a galloping Hessian, who he made out to be nothing more than a novice jockey. Brom did, though, corroborate the speed of the horseman. When he had come to the foot of the bridge atop Daredevil, the headless horseman bolted past and vanished in a flash of fire. These tales all told in the standard way, like campers huddled around the fire clinging to its warmth and the safety of the light amongst the endless cadre of the dark, hushed and quick-breathed, served to add to the gloom and demure of the surrounding Sleepy Hollow. As the last story's final syllables silenced the room in a dying gasp, the revelry left the party-goers, and the quaint hours of the evening took root. Some left, some stayed, and Ichabod stole away with his soon-to-be mistress. The two spoke, and not long into their interview it appeared things had soured, Ichabod swiftly but crestfallen plunged his way outside, retreating from his failed conquest much like the fallen Hessian. Except this time, it wasn't a head left behind, but a heart. The young mistress turned him down and dashed his hopes beyond redemption. He and his horse stumbled through the night-addled thicket, his mind fixated on his rejection. But not for long, as soon every twig snapped, every owl call, each rustled leaf, and even the cold kisses of the moon itself brought those stories of misbegotten things to the fore of Ichabod's lonely mind. In fact, with each story Ichabod recalled, the dark seemed to deepen. Soon he would find himself begging for the moon's presence, any fleeting light to help him traverse the infinite black. Much to Ichabod's rising dismay, He was well aware that the path he was set upon would put him directly into the epicenter of the darkest stories told this night. He beckoned his horse a quickened pace, a double-time step. Soon he would come upon the central marking of the forest road, a grand tulip tree, its roots blanketed by withered tulip petals dimly reflecting the eerie pale white of the moon. To an onlooker, you might see Ichabod's pallid constitution a byproduct of the fallen petals, but to Ichabod... This grim countenance was one spurned by fright in the very essence of dread. Because just past that tulip tree of decayed splendor was no man's land, sure to be the most trying part of the journey home. An infamous, haunted brook nestled into the dense bog of Wiley's swamp. It bore a bridge. A bridge of similar make to Brom Bones's and Old Brower's story. This one, though... Half sunk into the murk of the wetlands, treacherous on the clearest of days, a stranding death sentence on this gloomy autumn eve. Ichabod summoned every ounce of resolve and gave Gunpowder a score of swift kicks to the ribs, intent on clearing the bridge in a single bound. Old Gunpowder, being the wily creature he is, stepped to the side, soon to meet the same fate as the bridge. Ichabod's panic and collar began climbing up his throat. He kicked again, only for Old Gunpowder to throw the pair into the bridge's fence and begin running alongside it. This time, Ichabod would bring full bear the whip and his spurs, heaving with all his ardor, painfully aware that there are things present that should not be, that he should not linger, and... 
Old Gunpowder finally relented. Though not before thrusting the two through dense brambles, Ichabod felt the briars and could do naught but compare them to the gnashing teeth of fabled goblins and swamp snakes. They continued toward the bridge, as Ichabod inspected his many cuts and lashes, until Gunpowder's hooves abruptly scraped against the dirt and gravel in an attempt to immediately cease any forward momentum. Ichabod had been preoccupied, or else he would have seen it. Old Gunpowder huffed and reared his two front hooves into the air, blocking Ichabod's sight once more with his aging mane and thick and flexible neck. When four hooves met ground again, Ichabod refused to address the thing before him. A huge figure, atop a horse as black as midnight, clad in hessian armor, gallant and menacing in equal stature, waited. It only waited. Ichabod called out in no meaningful voice, asking who the horseman was and what it wanted. No reply would come other than the light trotting of the hulking stallion. It circled, as a show horse would, before setting off along the path. Ichabod involuntarily broke into a fervent psalm, and old gunpowder finally obeyed Ichabod's constant, incessant kicking. There would be no turning back. What hope was there to outrun this if the legends held true? If it moved as deftly as the wind through the trees, if it needed no rest, Ichabod had hope only that it wouldn't give chase. Gunpowder leapt the bridge, and Ichabod forced the horse into a canter, and then into a full gallop, as he enveloped the great horseman there who stood in the center of the path. Ichabod's hopes were dashed once again this night, as the horseman, the spitting image of war, leapt from the pages of revelations which Ichabod once sung, followed an equal step. Ichabod slowed the horse's pace, thinking he would simply lag behind the horseman, yet the horseman kept shoulder to shoulder, hoof to hoof. The path began to slope, a great hill here inclined, stretching into the blackest sky, matched in gloom by the aura of the great horseman who quickly took point. It was here now, illuminated in full against the brightness of a moon whole, brilliant and frostbitten, that Ichabod could see the true form of his woeful midnight companion. Gigantic, and muffled in a great black cloak, resting on Herculean shoulders, the rider outstretched his arms, welcoming Ichabod to dare a view of his headless torso. Fear, like no other, gripped Ichabod, only to be then eclipsed by the sight of the horseman's head hung from the pommel of his saddle, sardonically grinning, exsanguinated, and corpse-gaunt. Ichabod erratically slammed his legs into old Gunpowder's sides in an overwhelming despair. The horse took off in full leap, and the horseman's decapitated head cackled through the midnight air. The two of them raced through thin, reedy briars until those briars became thick, impenetrable walls of thorn and bramble. They tore through the forests, blanketed by dense mist and hanging vines, no care given to aim or destination. This was purely evasion. By some miracle, Ichabod made his way through the decrepit forest back to the path, and he could see the very road which turned off into Sleepy Hollow proper. This temporary relief would be all but that. Temporary. As if possessed by some demon of old, Gunpowder refused his rider's steering and galloped off in the opposing direction. Ichabod flailed, gripping at the horse's neck, trying to rest the head back toward the direction of the hollow, but in so doing accidentally unclasped his saddle. He endeavored with all of his strength to keep his grip, but the sweat, leather, and bramble-bought blood made the horn of the saddle slip from his fingers. He heard it snap under Gunpowder's hooves. Now, Ichabod Crane, pedagogue of Sleepy Hollow, master of psalm, and esteemed dancer, found himself skillless, meeting his match in bareback riding. Gunpowder continued down the trail through old sandy trees, rotten and weeping, before he had come to the twin of the wetland bridge. He could see it, in the distance, that whitewashed church lonely on its knoll in a dreary, ominous solitude, and he could hear it, the cackling of the undead rider behind him, the pounding of thunderous hooves, the billowing of the great black cloak. He had hope once more he was ahead. If he could just make it to the bridge, perhaps the horseman would vanish in a fleet of fire once again, and if not, he could make it to the church there, he would be protected as a man of the Psalms. Gunpowder's hooves clapped like thunder across the bridge's sturdy oaken planks, and Ichabod dared to breathe a full breath as they crossed the threshold. That would be his last. Ichabod turned in an instant, hearing the cackling nearing close. He felt the fiery, hot breath of hell as the creature's head collided with his own. Gunpowder came to a trot, and then a full stop, as its rider no longer could give commands. For unlike the Hessian, Ichabod's spirit leaves with his head. As the next morning dawned, 
and the early mist had cleared. Old gunpowder was found saddleless and grazing at Hans von Ripper's gate, Ichabod imprisoned. The entire town of Sleepy Hollow searched for the schoolmaster, turning over every rock but finding naught. All the schoolboys gathered at their typical time, and instead of reciting psalm, they strolled the banks of the river attempting to find any trace of Ichabod Crane. At the edge of the bridge, before the church, the boys had come upon deeply dented tracks in the mud, evidence of a massive horse riding at gratuitous speed. Beside the tracks, they found their late schoolmaster's hat on top of a smashed pumpkin. The townsfolk of Sleepy Hollow never found Ichabod Crane's body, and therefore another story was added to their lexicon of legends. The galloping Hessian adds another notch to his belt. Whether the story holds true in the common folk's eyes, the old matrons of Sleepy Hollow swear to its fidelity, and they're the folk who know the supernatural better than anyone else. I for one warrant that the town of Sleepy Hollow, its winding endless roads pathed through shifting forest and murky bog, bear two headless riders. And if one should find themselves near that New York cove, take heed, or you might just lose your head. With that, I have been your host, Benjamin Cloud. This was Just a Myth on the Mythic Muscle Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and happy Halloween. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. For only $3 a month, you get Discord access, and you buy me a protein bar. $5 a month lets you Discord access with special colors and emotes, blooper reels, a shout-out for me, and transcripts of each episode. $10 a month gets you all of that noise, a vote in our monthly poll, a personalized 10-second clip of whatever you want me to say, and every dollar spent at that tier goes right back into the podcast so that I might bring you a better listening experience. Follow my socials. You can find me on pretty much every platform by searching for Mythic Muscle Podcast and looking for the helmet crossed with the barbell on the microphone. If you made it this far, you're my favorite type of human. I hope you have a wonderful day, a fantastic lift, or if it's a rest day, you get some quality relaxation time. Thank you.